yell at you. Um, some of you have heard me speak before. You, you kind of know what my background is. But I'm used to actually yelling and not having a microphone. Thank you. So I apologize ahead of time. I'm going to try really hard to just talk in a normal voice. Uh, as Pastor Mike mentioned to you, my name is Todd. I am the youth and children's pastor here, and it is my distinct pleasure to be able to stand before you this morning and share a little bit of God's Word. As Pastor Mike mentioned, today is what? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. It's kind of like that warning bell that goes off. When I was a kid, that's when my mom and my grandmother and my aunts, okay, we need to figure out what we're doing for Easter dinner. We need to figure out who's going to get the ham, who's going to fix the green beans, all of that. As I grew up, Palm Sunday was not really that big of a deal. It was just that. It was the warning sign that Easter was coming. And today I want to explain to you a lot more of what was going on biblically and why it is a big deal and why it is something that we set aside a particular Sunday to celebrate. Before I get too far ahead of myself, though, let's pray. Father, it's a beautiful morning, and you have given us a beautiful gathering of your people. And Lord, I pray straight up from the very beginning that these words that I utter before them that would resonate in their heart would not be my own. Lord, you and I both know I'm not a whole lot of anything, and I pray, God, that you will take this willing vessel and that you will speak through me into the minds and hearts of these who are gathered and most of all lord that you would be glorified by the things that happened today we love you a whole bunch and we're looking forward to learning more about you in jesus name i pray amen go ahead and flip to the next slide this has been something that's been brewing in me for a couple of weeks pastor mike and i had a conversation about hey would you be able to preach on Palm Sunday? Absolutely, because I already know what I'm going to talk about. And uh, so it kind of fit in very nicely. Identity crisis is what we're going to talk about. But let me tell you from the beginning, it's not that I'm trying to communicate to you that Jesus didn't know who he was. That's not what we're talking about. Okay, are we clear on that? Uh, I'm not trying to raise any kind of questions that, well, you know, maybe Jesus wasn't willing. Or, well, maybe Jesus didn't do this voluntarily. That's not what I'm saying at all. The problem is never Jesus. It's always who? It's us. <laughs> we have a tendency to try and create these problems just because we are broken. And that's the whole reason why we need Jesus in our lives. I want to go ahead and take a look in our scripture passage. Because it's pretty straightforward, and you're going to notice that a lot of things that we read are going to be almost an exact duplicate of what Pastor Mike read out of the book of Luke. So go ahead and give me the first slide. As they approached Jerusalem, I'm sorry, this is in Mark chapter 11. I probably should have told you that. <laughs> it's in the bulletin, but just in case, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. So they went, and they found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it. He sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. 
He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May the reading of God's word be blessed. This story is something you have heard. If you have been a part of church culture your whole life, this is just, okay, that's the stuff we typically talk about. I don't understand why we're having to do it again this year. And I am not necessarily wanting to focus on the words with which you're familiar. I am asking you this morning to consider what is happening between the lines of what we have just read. In this place, Jesus is the central figure. But we're going to see that everyone who's looking at Jesus sees him differently. The identity of who this man of God is, is different. And in some cases, it directly conflicts with each other. Before I even get to that though, each one of us, well probably most all of us, have a wallet or a purse. And I can look in here and I can get out driver's license. I didn't want a picture of that up there because I want y'all to actually <laughs> come back to church again. I also have a military ID because I did some time in the military. A military ID. What is ID short for? Identification. This is how anyone, if something were to happen to me and they find my wallet, oh, this dude served in the Air Force. It is an ID. It is a means by which I am identified. And in this perspective, you know that it was for military service. Well, ID has a lot of other context to it as well. I work in a different place during the week, much like you guys do. And there I am known as I am identified as a pastor of after school and summer camp. They don't know me as a youth and children's pastor because you do. This is a different context, a different world. When I step through the household door of mine, I am not the pastor of youth and children. I am not the pastor of after school and summer camp. I am the pastor of my home. I am dad. I am husband. So even though I am one person, I wear different hats. Jesus is the same way, at least so many people thought. Here's what I want to show you. Because when you start talking about Bethany and Bethphage, and I don't know what any of that means. I don't know the map up here. This is a map, and it's going to be harder for you to see. But I want you to notice... You see on the right hand side of the screen, that's where Bethany is. And Jesus and his disciples took off from Bethany. And they were walking, and they were walking, and they got through what they believe was where Bethphage is. It's actually one of the more convoluted towns of New Testament times. And so you see they're headed to where? Where are they going? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Thank you. <laughs> They're going to Jerusalem. And I automatically have assumed for a very long time that, well, he went into the front gates of Jerusalem and said, here I am on my donkey. When in fact, if you look at how the city of Jerusalem is put together, where did he go into Jerusalem? What portion? Can you read that? The temple. Whoa, hold on. That's like me walking into Columbia, but instead of going to the State House, I decide to go into First Baptist of Columbia. That's where I show up. It's really interesting. Why would he have done that? So we're going to look at that as well. But I wanted you to have this visual, because this red line, once you get past Bethphage, is somewhere in there between Bethphage and Jerusalem is where Jesus picked up the donkey. He sat on the donkey and he took off and went into Jerusalem. So next slide. Identity. This gathering that Jesus attended was Passover. What does Passover mean? Where does it come from? Is it a New Testament thing? Long time ago. God said, I want you to celebrate the Passover festival. Why? What did he do? Okay, that is when the death angel 
passed over all the doorways, the homes of the Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt. So it's very important. That's when all the Egyptian firstborn died. And I've been teaching my other kids that I work with the importance and how upsetting it was that all of these children lost their lives simply because the Pharaoh would not give in to the God of the universe. So this is a celebration. They've done it forever. Everyone gathers. It's not just, well, if you feel like going, then you need to go. No, this is a gathering of all parts of Israel. So you've got people groups, tribes, you've got different families that are showing up in one place. Then, of course, because you saw the map of the temple, you've got priests, Pharisees and Sadducees everywhere. You've got all of Jesus' disciples. The scripture that Mike and I both read discusses the fact that Jesus had a group with him. And so on and so forth. There's a lot of people. So here are the four different identities that people are shoving at Jesus. Number one is man. There are people who were there when Mary gave birth to Jesus. There are people who were there who remember Jesus running through the streets, playing with their children. Really nice kid. Man, he was, he was so, he had manners and he did good work. And they remember this same kid growing up and he starts doing carpentry work because that's what his dad did. They know him to be a good kid. What do you mean he's the son of God? I know him. He's not the son of God. He's just the son of Joseph. Who happens to be able to do a few cool tricks. And so that's how they would look at Jesus. As he's on this donkey. I don't know why they're making such a big deal of him. I can preach better than he can. Do you see the perspective that I'm trying to give you? So there were many people who assumed he's just a man. Nothing special, nothing exciting, whatever. So then you have the next one. Some people saw Jesus as a minion. I'm not talking about the little chubby yellow things that you see in a movie. Okay? <laughs> not what I'm talking about at all. No, but the people who saw Jesus as a man were those who would have grown up where he did. Minions. There are multiple passages where the Pharisees and the Sadducees accused Jesus of being aligned with Beelzebub, which is the devil. That the things Jesus was doing was not by God's power, but was, was by evil power. So you've got that whole group of people who are angry when they see Jesus showing up with this whole entourage. Oh, we need to get rid of this guy because now he's not only doing mighty stuff over here. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead. I need to throw that in there too. But that's not, he's not of God. If he were of God, he would be listening to who? Pharisees and the Sadducees. They didn't like the fact that Jesus was exerting himself and saying things and doing things that they opposed. They saw him not as a man. They saw him as a minion of evil. Some kind of manifestation of evil power. Well, that's not very nice, is it? You don't hear stuff like that in church. But it is something that people are looking at him as his entourage goes by and they're mad. We need to kill this guy because he's taking all of God's people away from us. So then the next one. A man, a minion, a monarch. Now this is one of the ones that we get hooked into. All those people who followed Jesus who took off their outer garments and they laid them on the ground. Or took off their garments and put them on the donkey. So Jesus wouldn't have to ride bareback the whole way. Well, at least there's a little bit of cushion for you, Jesus. Why would they do that? Because they thought it's butt kicking time. Jesus is not just going to raise a guy from the dead. He's not just going to change water into wine. He's not just going to give the deaf 
the ability to hear, and the blind the ability to see. This guy is here to take over. And I am one of his favorites. I get to walk beside the donkey that he's riding on. He is sitting on my cloak. Now we look at that as, what? That's ridiculous. That's what was going on. The Jews were living under oppressive leadership, which were the Romans. And they're always looking around. There's got to be somebody here that can save us, right? There's a Messiah. I remember my grandfather teaching me about the Messiah. But man, where is he? Because we are hating life right now under these pagan Romans. Under these heathen Romans. So when they saw that Jesus could do this and could do this and could do this. And man, he talks really intelligently. He talks like he's got authority. He must be the one. But that perspective was a little bit cockeyed, right? Did Jesus show up to take over? No. My friends, that's why all the people who are so excited when Jesus came into Jerusalem are part of that same crowd that said crucify him. He's a fake. He's a charlatan. He's a quack. He didn't do what I wanted him to do, so go ahead and just kill him. Because we didn't find the right Messiah. You see how dangerous that is? The other thing I'll point out to you. If you look historically. There are many different accounts. Of people coming into a city as a conquering hero. As the conquering king. Didn't they ride a donkey? No, that's embarrassing. What are you talking about? You're going to bring a donkey? No, you're supposed to ride one of those big white horses, right? And you got your cape flowing behind you. And you got all these people who are running beside you and they're singing about you. And then all of the prisoners of war are hanging out behind your horse or your chariot because that is symbolism of raw, unbridled power. Well, Jesus, does anybody have a white horse? No, nah, man, just go get me the donkey out of the next town up. Donkey? That's not very symbolic. And there's no prisoners of war because Jesus didn't come to conquer. He came to save. That different perspective we'll talk about in a minute. So monarch was close. It was close because, my friends, there is a day coming. And I need you to hear me say this. There is a day coming when Jesus is going to be the monarch that comes back and destroys everything that is in opposition to God. So just because Palm Sunday is not necessarily about that part of Jesus' mission, oh, it's coming. And that's why I plead with you. That's why Pastor Mike pleads with you. If you don't know who this Jesus is that I'm talking about, we need to talk about it. Because the consequences are eternal. Not just next week. Anyway. Man, minion, monarch. There was a select group, very few, very small, very intimate group of people, including Jesus himself, who realized he was not a man, not a man, not a monarch, but he was a Messiah. This is what you hear from the pulpits on Sunday mornings when it comes close to Easter. I'm not here to teach you Jesus was the king then. He wasn't. He came in like a king would come in, kind of. But did you notice in the last verse, in verse 11, did Jesus come in and stay in the five-star hotel of Jerusalem? Did he go to the finest restaurant that night and then retire back into his presidential suite? He didn't even stay in Jerusalem. Jesus, <laughs> you're the monarch, you're the Messiah. You should have a place somewhere in here. No, there's no room at the end there, guys. Jesus came in to the temple. You remember the map? He looked around. Oh, we're going to have to deal with this. But then he left because it was so late. That's like me going into Columbia. And I'm like, yep, there's some business here I need to take care of tomorrow. But... Not for tonight. And I leave Columbia. I get back in my rental car. And I drive to Lexington. And I stay in a hotel there. Well, that's not very kingly either. 
but it's because the identity of Jesus was not wrapped up in political power, not wrapped up in military might. It was wrapped up in saving our souls. And I'm thinking, man, I'm glad I wasn't Jesus. Because having, having all of these things flashing around me, my tendency is to share at the bright and shiny things. Really? You think I could be the monarch of this place? Jesus had one singular path. And as he rode the donkey in, and then he rode the donkey back. Actually, you know what? He probably walked back. Because he said, I'm going to give the donkey back to you. Debatable. We could talk about that. But when it comes to Messiah, Jesus had one mission from God. And it was not tainted by man. As much as man wanted to taint it, Jesus said, no. I'm here to die. No, Jesus, that's not what you're here for. You are the greatest thing since sliced bread. You have given us new life, new breath. And Jesus said, yes, I have. But my purpose here is to be your Messiah, not your king, not the minion of evil, and not just some dude. I am here with a much, much, much higher purpose. Friends, in those 11 verses, in the passage that Pastor Mike read, this is what's swirling around Jesus. And we just look at the words and assume, well, that was a really nice story. Let's go have lunch. I don't want you to leave here just thinking about 1 through 11. I want you to think about all of these different pieces of this puzzle and how they all were as a confluence into one individual. And Jesus is trying to stay on his mission, but everyone else is trying to change the mission that Jesus is on. And the reason why I'm telling you that this morning is because guess who does that as well? We do. And that's not cool. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about in the second portion. I have no idea where I am in my notes. One second. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead and flip it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. You know who Jesus was to the people in the story. Who is he to you? Because quite honestly, it's good for us to learn what happened back in the day. It's good for us to have that in our mind. It's good for us to take God's word and hide it and put it in our heart so that we are trying to live it out and we're trying to, to live out what it is saying. This morning, I need to know. God wants to know. Jesus of Nazareth, who is he to you? Is he just a man? Go ahead and flip it. There are people sitting in this room. I dare say. There are people sitting in this room. Jesus was a historical figure. Yes. He was nice. He did wonderful things. He helped people. I really like the guy. I would have been hanging out with him. If I were in Bible times. He was a good man. Our society looks at Jesus some segments of our society look at Jesus as nothing more than just a prophet of God. Nothing out of the ordinary, just like the rest of us. Okay, they say he was sinless, but was he really sinless? He's just a man. He was a legendary figure. One of my favorite things growing up was the legendary figure of Chuck Norris. Have y'all heard these? Chuck Norris, when he was born, slapped the doctor. <laughs> and I wish I could come up with a few more because there's some really funny ones, right? Chuck Norris is who? He's an actor. But he played in some roles and he's got some skills that all of a sudden <laughs> he became a legendary figure. And Chuck Norris will not die. He'll kill death. I mean, there's, there's things like that that kind of float around. The internet and just as we were growing up, things that we like to banter back and forth. There are some people that think, well, that's what happened to Jesus. Yes, he was in all these places and he had all these people following him. But you know, over time, because the Bible was passed and passed and passed by word of mouth. And then it was written down. 
You know what? I bet he's a legendary figure. All these things didn't really happen, but just like Chuck Norris, it sounds really cool. It makes for a great story. He's a nice guy. He was a martyr. There are people historically. You can look at historical writings and you can see there are historians grappling with the fact that he wasn't anything special. He's just someone who died for what he believed in. He was a martyr. He wasn't a god. He didn't come back to life. No, 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 no. He was a guy and he died for a cause. That's what we do too. Some of us, because it's safe. If Jesus was just a man, that's safe. He can't step on my toes. He can't hold me accountable or anything because that was just a great story like the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus and all these other things that have taken place. Secondly, we are seeing a growing number of people in our society who don't view Jesus even to be a man. He is an instrument of evil. Now, the reason why he's characterized as an instrument of evil is because the definition of evil has been changed. We have taken and rewritten history. You're watching that happening outside these walls every week. And what used to be unheard of, you can't say that word, abortion. We're at a place now where there are people having parties after their abortion. Or they're having People bring gifts. And I'm not making this up. There are people bringing gifts to this expectant mother before the pregnancy is terminated. Not baby gifts, but just gifts of, yes, exert your personal freedom. Yes, you want to do it, you do it. So because of that, Jesus as the ultimate good capital G, those definitions are biblically switching. So there are people that look at Jesus as he's divisive. Man, if he would have just behaved, everything would have been just fine because humanity holds the key to what peace is and to what goes on after the fact. If he would have just sat down and shut up, we all would be in a much better place. Now that's kind of weird because we're churchified and that doesn't make sense. But you go outside these doors, there are a lot of people that think that Jesus was a manipulator. Now, you know I'm saying these things out of sarcasm, right? (laughs) I'm not teaching you this is what it is. But it is important for you to see the differing perspective, the identity crisis that's happening in amongst our population, the world's population. He's a manipulator. He took things. And yeah, water into wine. Okay, whatever. He probably had a Kool-Aid packet or something he dumped in there. There's got to be some kind of explanation. You see those little high seed packets you dump in there, you shake it up. Jesus was deceptive. Jesus was not one to say, I am the Son of God. Now, what he did reflected that, but in many, many cases, Jesus said, Shh, don't tell anybody. My time has not yet come. Well, dude, you're manipulating everything. You're making people follow you because you're able to do these sleight of hand tricks And I bet you and Lazarus had something going on beforehand so that when he's laying in the tomb, you could call out his name and here he comes. Oh my goodness, we need to follow Jesus. You are manipulating us. Even now, these things that Jesus upholds, these two laws. Remember there were ten commandments and Jesus said, hold on, I can swish them. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. Right? But the the intention behind it, people have started to question. Because again, good and evil are starting to switch roles. And we see that. And man, it's disappointing. Jesus was theatrical. There's a dead guy, I'll take care of it. There's a bl- Where's the blind guy? Who has a disease that I can cure? That's the way our society pictures Jesus as one who's capitalizing on moments of pl- publicity Instead of meek, humble, yeah, I'll help. 
Wait, somebody touched my garment. No, somebody touched my garment. Jesus could have continued walking, but he said, No! Someone touched my garment. Oh, Jesus, I mean, you're a drama king. Now, we know that not to be true. And then lastly, toxic. We need to stay away from Jesus because he's teaching that he is representing God. He is the God who said marriage is between one man and one woman. Oh, uh uh-uh. No, we, we can't have that. Jesus, your teaching is wrong. Jesus, you are creating disciples who are so tunnel visioned towards God, they're not accepting all of the other things where good and evil have changed places. That's a little uncomfortable, isn't it? But that is where the hatred of who Jesus is as a minion of evil has come from. Because he's willing to stand up and say, my, my book doesn't change. Society has rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. Mine doesn't change. Okay? So man or minion, is that who Jesus is to you? Because if that's where you are, man, I'd love to talk with you. Pastor Michael, there's several people in here that love to talk to you. Because the Jesus that I know was not just a man. The Jesus I know wholeheartedly is not a minion or an instrument of evil. So what's next? Monarch. This is where a lot of us are. Jesus is the king of everything. That is a foregone conclusion. We know that He sees all, knows all, and is everywhere. We know that. That is scriptural in the New Testament. That is part of our complete foundation of theology. So because of that, well, Jesus, I need I got myself in a mess. And I need you to use that authority. Can you throw the scepter down? Can you say the word? And rescue me from my bad decisions. You're the king. I can do whatever I want to do because I've got the king's business card in my back pocket. Because I know him and I talk to him. Is that fair? That's not fair at all. But that's how even Christians look at him. And that's how we look at him in seasons. Well, I'll make a deal with you, God. If you'll get me out of this, then I promise... I'll go to church a couple of times a month. You know what? If you you rescue me from this mess that my life choices have created, then you know what? Okay, I'll even throw a check in the offering plate. What? Jesus is not our genie. Jesus is not the king that we can run to with the expectation that he's going to get us out of jail every single time. That is not the way my Jesus is. The Jesus of the Bible has reflected himself to be. Oh, you know what? Because Jesus has the cattle on the thousand hills. And because he wants me to be happy, he's going to make me prosper. Because he's a king. King can do whatever he wants. Were the disciples rich? Was Paul rich? I don't know about you, but I'm not even close. You can't look at Jesus as some kind of vending machine. Some kind of one-armed bandit. Are they still calling that? I'm old. One-armed bandit that's in the casino. Where you put in, I'll give you a little bit of my life and I'm going to pull the lever. And wow, look at all the stuff I get because I've identified you as my king. Ooh. I hope you don't look at him that way. There's also this expectation. And this is where we're getting wrapped up in right now. Jesus, you've got to overthrow the evils of our government and our political system and our, um, all of the different pieces of who we are. I need you to come in and take over. Quit playing around with letting people make all these mistakes. You are the king. Why don't you come in and fix it? That was the expectation the disciples had of Jesus when he went into Jerusalem on a donkey. Jesus said, that's not my purpose. You're you're misquoting me. You're taking my life and my kingship, yes. But you're taking it out of context. I'm not here to overpower your opposition. I'm here to do something a little bit different. Because I am not as concerned about your circumstances as I am about your soul. Because what's happening to you here, man, it's going to hurt. And it may follow you some years of your life. 
or you may end up not living as long as you think you should be able to, but if your soul is in my hands, guess what? You're going to live forever. And what happened to you on earth? You're not even going to remember it. Because what I have for you in heaven is something so incredible and so massive and so beautiful. There's no more tears. There's nothing like that going on. And those sufferings you had are going to pale in comparison. So I don't know. Maybe you, this is how you look at Jesus on this Palm Sunday. As we get ready to celebrate Easter next Sunday. He's the king. And because of that, he's going to save me. From my circumstances, he's going to make me prosper, give me stuff, because he wants me to be happy. And, Jesus, you need to come down here and just obliterate anything evil. Just take it out. Pornography, take it out. That's what they wanted to do to him whenever he walked in Jerusalem, sitting on a donkey. So who is he to you? How about Messiah? This is where I look you in the eye. Because my friends, as much fun maybe as some of those other comparisons are, as intriguing, as curious as some of those things are, this is where Jesus is on Palm Sunday. This is the capacity that He fills from now until He comes back on a white horse, that's what Revelation tells us, as a conquering king. He's not here to save you from every single circumstance of life. Even though we'd like for Him to, He's here to save you from your what? He's here to take that junk, that disease that's in every one of us, and it festers, and it stinks, and it's gooey, and it's gross. And Jesus said, you know what? Next Sunday, when you see me rise from the dead, that's what takes care of all of that. I want you to look at Jesus as the Messiah. The one who saves you from your sins. If you can get that as your number one, you're going to be in good shape. Secondly, Jesus never said, I'm going to pick you up every time life gets a little tough. It's okay, I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to take you and I'm going to put you over here on these nice, comfortable pillows. Jesus said, I'm going to be with you forever. And take heart, because I've already overcome the world. Whatever the world throws at you, whatever circumstances are created by your bad decisions or by the bad decisions of others that have affected you, the Messiah, He may not pick you up and take you out of it, but you better believe He's holding your hand as you walk through it. There's even that old school poem where He picks you up and carries you. It's not what a man does. It's not definitely not what a minion does. It's not even what a king with an iron fist does. The person that we're talking about, the God we are discussing is your Messiah. And if you are in that season of life where the world is burning up around you, I get it. I think we've all been there. But know that as the Messiah, He's going to be with you. Even when it sounds like God is being completely silent. Oftentimes when he's completely aside, that's when he's doing the greatest things. Because we're relying heavily on him. What does that last one say? And I'm sorry I had to use F instead of 4. Didn't have enough room to scrunch it in there. Did you know that your Messiah loves you enough? He loves me enough and he's going to wait me whenever I get there. He's not just going to save the world and disappear into another universe. He is in heaven right now at the right hand side of the Father, interceding for us. Interceding, that's a churchy word, that basically means that when we ask for forgiveness, Jesus is like, Dad, that one's mine. And your sins are forgiven. He's waiting on you. He's not waiting on this whole entire church. He's not waiting on America by definite. By definite means he is waiting on every one of us. Because that's how much he cares about you. That's how much he loves you. And that's the reason why he went to the cross. Which we are going to be commemorating this Friday. Does that make pretty good sense? So 
You're supposed to tell somebody something and then tell them what you're telling them and then tell them what you told them. That's how a sermon is built right there. <laughs> so, so let me review for you real quick. Jesus did go into Jerusalem, but He didn't show up on a white horse. He went into Jerusalem, a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But it was not because He was there to take over. It was because He was there to save the world. Not just those people or us, but even looking backwards. So, whenever He's writing in there, even though the Scripture says these are very definitive and boxed-in events, there were a lot of different people looking at Him a lot of different ways through a lot of different glasses one of them was he's just a man i grew up with him nice guy but nothing special there was a segment of population the religious leadership who said that dude's evil because he's teaching stuff that's contrary to what we as the pastors and the priests are teaching so he's a, a instrument of evil he's a monarch jesus is oh by the way one of the prevalent reasons judas iscariot betrayed him Historians believe is because Judas believed also. Jesus just needs a little kickstart. So I'm going to get a little bit of money and I'm going to go hand him over to the authorities and then it's going to be like Thor where he, rah, he breaks out and he becomes that king that everyone is looking for. And that's why whenever Judas realized Jesus didn't do that. Jesus he let himself be arrested. What do you mean? He's letting himself be tried? He became so guilt-ridden because of what he had done. What did he do? He hung himself. So even that some of the disciples thought only that Jesus was here to take over. And then lastly, and this is the big one, and that's the Messiah. There were disciples, and of course Jesus himself understood what his mission was. And my friends, if you read Scripture... You too will understand his mission. Instead of just grabbing hold of the things that you think you want Jesus to be. I want you to read the Bible and see who he actually is. And I hope that, that you are getting this from our pulpit here. You are getting this not just from our pulpit. But man, you're reading yourself. You are studying. You are listening to podcasts. Whatever it takes for you to learn more about who this guy is that rode in on a donkey on Palm Sunday. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day and for what it represents and how it's not just some kind of alarm clock to get us ready for Easter, but there is definitive purpose. Lord, it amazes me how you operate in ways that I don't expect and in, in cases where it just doesn't seem like that fits into my line of thinking. Lord, I thank you that you are who you are and you are not who I necessarily want you to be. I praise you, Lord, for the things that we have talked about, the elements we have discussed. And, and Lord, over this coming week, I would ask you to be in the heart and mind of every person sitting in this room, that this would not be something they would be able to just sit down as though it is an event of the past. Lord, but you would wrestle with the hearts and minds of all of us and that we would become very aware of who we think you are and that you would draw us into your word to show us what the truth is. Father, I ask you to bless this congregation. I ask you to bless the shepherd that's here with us, Pastor Mike. God, I ask you to, to be with each of us in our own distinctive worlds, but help us all to be unified in understanding your identity. And may it never be a crisis that we uh, get in the middle of. It's in Jesus' mighty and holy name I bless this congregation. Amen.